Savior. Yeah. Hey guys, what's happening? Am I live or what? What about your friends? Okay, folks, how you guys doing? It's been a while. What was the last session? Was it last Wednesday or was it Tuesday? I think it was Tuesday, right? Is, I hope the light's not bothering you in the back. Yeah. What happened? There was 16, we're down to 12? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Man, we only we only have only 12 people now. Oh my goodness. See? I lose people more and more. Now we're down to 11. Oh my goodness. Folks, what happened? I went from 16 to 11. Oh my goodness. I think Haterwood is right. I'm just going to lose people. It's going to be just me and Protestant. All right. Again, I'm hooked up to the modem. I'm not using Wi-Fi. So it's going to probably buffer a few times, but let's see. Waiting for a few more minutes, by the grace of Jesus. Let me see if the light, should I turn it this way a little bit? Yeah. No, or, no, that way is, let's see. Let's see, should I turn this way? What's up, Netta? I heard, Netta, there was World War Three, and your Discord. People were attacking me, and you didn't block them, Netta, but it's okay. I'll ignore that and forgive you, Netta. Sorry, I don't care what people say about you. And how you try to work all sides of the fence. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to fix the angle. Is the light too much? Is the light too much or is it okay? I don't know, man. What's going on here? Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. How you doing, Mary? Good to see you. Guys, I hope you missed me. I haven't been on since Tuesday, but none. when I say none of you, a handful of the brothers, sisters have been asking. About five people have asked how come you're not live streaming? Everyone else didn't ask. I guess no one else cared. Nobody cared. Uh, I don't blame you. With my issues, I wouldn't care either. Alfonso Spirit. Okay. Hopefully. Ho, ho, ho. Who would go? It would blow me away if we got to 200. And we stayed at 200 for a while, not losing anyone. And then in time, we get it to about 1,000 to blow away Haterwood. Haterwood, by the grace of Jesus Christ. Right. I heard he took a shot on me yesterday. Hey, Scott. Hey, brother. Why don't I just tell you my social security, my address, the name of the judge, and my ex-wife's lawyers so we can talk about it publicly? Come on, Scott, brother. You, you know you kill me, right, bro? You used to be a cop, right? You know, I love you, Scott. You're all right, man. I love you, bro. Scott, what happened, bro? You used to be a good kid, Scott. What happened, man? What happened to you, bro? You're okay, man. You ask me that. What happened to you, Scott? Man? You used to be a good person. I don't mean to waste your time, guys. I'm just waiting for a few more minutes for the regulars to show up. Hopefully, the regulars will come. It's a Sunday. Everyone went to church this morning, hopefully. So now it's evening. They're getting to, I don't know, man. This light's bothering me because I think it's going to bother you. Thank you, Blue. Blue. If you guys make your names more complicated than necessary, I'm going to start blocking you. Thank you, Blue Bubbletron. And now that you supported me with... With whatever currency that is, the Lord Jesus bless you. But I'm going to block you because <clears throat> your name is a tongue twister. Try to say Blue Bubble Tron five times fast. You see, there you go. I have a lisp. David read a comment or did David make a comment, Hayden? Don't confuse the two. He either read a comment by someone saying, the quality of my life stream is bad, or he made a comment. Which is it, Hayden? You're starting to sound like Muhammad, who is illiterate. Okay. Let's see. So someone in the live chat complained about the quality of my live stream. And David read it and didn't rebuke him. Is that what you're saying, Hayden? Okay, anyway, so you got already a complainer, a whiner. 
Yeah, the, the light's a little too bright because, see, I have no darkness in me. I'm just so full of light. I don't need the light to be brighter, okay? Right. Let's see if we can fix this. Haters, man. I haven't seen you guys since Tuesday already starting to hate. Let's see. Already, man. We haven't even started. Complaints. Why is it the more I turn, the more this light doesn't disappear? What is up with this light, dude? Come on. Whew. I'm trying, folks. I am really trying. And I'm trying to angle it away from the light. Luisa, huh? He's a hater, man. If I turn it off, then it's going to be even bad, the quality. All right. Anyway. All right. By the grace of God, Father, so spirit. I'm just waiting again. A few more people to show up because I really want people to hear. I got... Clips from three different testimonials. Clips from three different testimonials. And what they have in common is they were all former Christians. One's from the Netherlands, from Europe. The other two are from America. Two males, two men, one female, one woman. And I want you to hear their reasons why they converted. Okay. So what I need you guys to do is invite people to come, pray for the regulars to show up, pray the Lord Jesus will guide this conversation, control this session, bless this session, anoint this session, filling us with the Holy Spirit, filling me with the Holy Spirit, destroying all distractions of the enemy, that we will be covered by the Holy Blood of Jesus, washed in the Holy Blood of Jesus, purified and cleansed in the Holy Blood of Jesus, and filled with the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit, because we love you, Father. We love the Lord Jesus, your beloved, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the world, your only begotten Son, Father, your heart that became flesh. And we love your Holy Spirit, Father, your eternal, glorious, sovereign, beautiful Spirit, the eternal Spirit of your Son, the Holy Spirit of the living God. We depend on you, Father, and need you. We depend and need your Son, the Lord Jesus. We depend and need your Holy Spirit. So, Father, I say, I ask that first loosen my tongue by the power of the Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit will guide and control the words of my mouth, saving me from error, from stammering, and confusion, Father. Please, for the sake of your Son, the Lord Jesus, I ask for that grace and that anointing. Anoint my words to speak truth clearly. <clears throat> to speak it passionately, to speak it correctly, to recall the passages correctly, interpret them perfectly by the power of your Holy Spirit with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your Holy Spirit, Father. And Father, I ask on behalf of everyone that you fill every one of us, every one of us, with life from your Spirit, with power from your Holy Spirit, with faith and love and trust and wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your glorious Holy Spirit. Fill us with fruit from your Holy Spirit and crucify our flesh father destroy our flesh destroy the fruit and stain of our flesh father and forgive us when we fail you father empower us not to fail you but to conquer the flesh more and more and walk more perfectly in union with your holy spirit father in jesus almighty name to become more like the lord jesus in the way we love you and the way we worship you and the way we live for you and to live your word perfectly to understand your word proclaim your word to obey your word live out your word and the might and power of your spirit and even die for your word. Your word is the Holy Bible, your voice to us, to be enslaved to your voice, to be in love with your voice, to be transformed by your voice, Father, and not the voice of any other, the voice of the Lord Jesus, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Please, my God, your voice, enslaved to the voice of your Son, enslaved to the voice of your Holy Spirit, because when you speak, your Son speaks in union with you. Your Holy Spirit speaks in union with you and your Son. And the Bible is your voice, the voice of the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, give us the grace to live it out. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Fill my chest and my lungs and my throat with the breath of life. And Father, watch over us and our loved ones, my daughters. Keep us safe from all these diseases that are scaring the world, such as this coronavirus. We laugh at it because we know we serve a living Savior who is our healer, our great physician, and nothing can happen to us apart from his will. And if it's your will for us to get coronavirus, you have a reason and a purpose, and we trust in you. We trust in your Son, the Lord Jesus. We trust in your Holy Spirit, and we trust in 
your purpose and your will for whatever happens to us, because whatever happens to us, you permit it to transform us to become more like Jesus. And we trust in that, Father. We thank you. We love you. You are a good God. You are a good Father. The Lord Jesus is a beautiful Savior. And by his wounds, by the blood of his cross, we are whole. We are healed spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically. And we trust in Jesus and the blood of his cross. And by your Holy Spirit, we are more than conquerors, yielding to your Spirit, Father. Bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters. Preserve them. Wash them. And the blood of Jesus and provide for them. Provide for us, Father, please, and save us from all the agents of the devil, whether judges or lawyers or politicians or even policemen. We trust in you and your salvation to preserve us till the end forever and ever to glorify you. We don't worship you enough, Father. We don't praise you enough. We don't pray to you enough. We don't sing to you enough. And we don't obey you enough. Help us to do more of that. And save us from our wickedness and our idleness and our laziness, Father, especially me. Again, I want to say we love you, Baba. We love you, Abba. We love you, Bobby. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Bring them, Father, to this session and bless this session. Please, Lord, and purify my motives to do it for the glory of Christ, never to prostitute or whore myself for fame or fortune, Lord. To do it for the glory of Christ with integrity in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit. Yes, please, guys, let's not fight. I'm not saying I believe the media hype about the coronavirus. In fact, point of fact, let's not fight about this. Let's not start a debate about the coronavirus. Let me be upfront with you. I could care less about the coronavirus. I laugh at the media hysteria over the coronavirus. I just mentioned that because in case someone does get it, may the Lord Jesus heal that person by the blood of his cross, by his wounds, by his stripes. But don't think I can. Guys, I laugh at the media's his, his, <laughs> hysteria over the coronavirus. Okay? But still, people do get sick. There are people who have contracted the coronavirus, like they've contracted the flu. In fact, I've been told more people die of the flu than they do of the coronavirus. So don't think I mentioned it because, oh, I'm panicking. Oh, that's it. I'm going to wash my hands 50 times a day. And I'm not going to go to these places. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, right? You know how many events have been canceled because of the coronavirus? All right. You understand? So may the Lord Jesus be glorified. And may he give us the power to trust in him and hope in him. And know that our lives and even our death are in his sovereign hands. You cannot die apart from the Lord Jesus permitting it. And or decreeing it, right? See? Look what Pedro just said. My school is going to get closed because of the coronavirus. Yeah, panicking. Yeah, in time, Hayden, we're going to get that. And think, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a signed autographed T-shirt. And in order to commemorate the fact that you will be the first to get that shirt, I'm going to block you the day I ship it out. All right? Okay, folks, pray that the regulars show up. I haven't been on since Tuesday. You know what kind of sad me, though? Only about five people, five people reached out to me and said, hey, how come you're not live streaming? Five people? That means the rest of you didn't care? You didn't care and ask, hey, Sam, are you alive or dead? Did you go to heaven in a better place? Gee, thanks for the love, folks. But anyway, praise the Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay. I, I was hoping that the regulars would show up, and most of you are here, but there are a few more faces that are not here. I don't know, but I don't want to keep dragging this because we need to begin. Guys, pray by the grace of Jesus Christ. I did meet someone local that does <clears throat> professional photography and, and recording, and he's a whiz at YouTube, and he's a local. So he's willing to record short clips, pre-record them, and upload them to the YouTube channel. So pray that... I'm intentional about doing that sooner than later by the grace of God. And thank the Lord for the mods who are serving me to serve you. Thank our brother Protestant believer because what he's doing is he actually goes and he beatifies the YouTube uh, sessions by putting up thumbnails, information, and description <clears throat> box and doing all he can. And he doesn't get paid for it. Neither does first and last. They do it for the sake of Jesus out of their love for Jesus, right? 
So hopefully pray that this local contact, he's a believer on fire for the first and last, they do it for the sake of Jesus, out of their love for Jesus, right? So hopefully pray that this local contact, he's a believer on fire for the Lord, we'll start doing these sessions. Pray for that, really, because I need the Lord Jesus by his grace and mercy. You know, to just pour out his blessings, strong internet connection, beatify the YouTube channel to reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ, to make this information easy and understandable and accessible. Anything I can with the breath I have until Jesus calls me home to do the work that I believe Jesus has called me to do it with integrity and to give my utmost for his highest because he's worthy. Okay, now that said, I think I'm going to begin. Before we get into the topic, there are three testimonials. What's repeating itself? It's repeating itself? What's repeating itself? You guys have blown me away. A sort of truth. Someone just said there was too much lighting. And now you're telling me it's too dark. So you can't appease everyone. Okay. You know how I love we have so many chiefs and not enough Indians and everyone's pontificating? Someone told me it's too bright. It's okay. Someone's saying it's too dark and now they want the window. You, you sure you want the light of the window? Okay. Jumping like a monkey. You're going to be jumping on a tree in a minute. Let's test your theory out. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Here we go. Aha. Aha. Okay. Let's test this out. Because, you know, everyone's a chief. Everyone knows how to solve problems. And you know what's sad? They can't even solve their own stinking personal problems, but they can solve mine. Okay. All right. Here you go. Oh, ah, all right. Ah, okay. Here. Here, here's this beautiful window. Here you go. Hi, Mr. Window. How are you? Okay. Did that help? Jumping like a monkey. Did that make you happy? Did that lighting appease you? Are you okay? Or do I need to get you a banana? Would you like a banana? Oh, so you want me to turn it around? And have the window facing me, but not the camera. Is that what you want? Jumping like a monkey? Boo-hoo. Okay. Boo-hoo. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, here we go. Boo-hoo. Let's say I don't want him to be upset. Hold on. I'm sorry. And people wonder why I got these mental issues. All right, friend. Here we go. Here we go. I hope my monkey friend won't get upset. Here it is. Let's see if that's going to work. And now you see my TV set. Anything to help? Okay. How about that? Is that good now? Did that make you happy? Everybody? Is that better? Because soap suds, when I see your face, I get upset because you have a face that even a mother has a hard time loving. Is that good now? Jumping like a monkey? Do I need to send you a box of bananas? Hey, you know what? You're kind of taking it too far, jumping like a monkey. You know? You are not the boss of me. Anyway, here, we, here I stay. Hey, friend, you don't tell me to go to the right or left. You go to the right because you're always on the wrong side. Keep jumping. You little monkey. <laughs> now people are going to wonder why I call him a monkey because his neck is jumping like a monkey. All right. Are we ready now? By the grace of Jesus Christ. See, now someone told me I need a new cam. Even though this is an updated brand new Mac, I need a new cam. Darn you, Mac. You will not live up to the expectations of these <clears throat> chiefs, know-it-alls, who are not satisfied that you're a brand new Mac, less than two years old, and your camera stinks, Mac. All right, let's let's focus now. We ready? Everyone ready now? And hit that like button. Okay, let's get into serious matters. All right. There are three clips, not clips. There are three testimonials because it's more than one clip. Three videos, three testimonials. Of three people, two males, one female, one from the Netherlands who used to work for Geert Wilder's political party, a political party that tried to stop Islam 
from existing in the Netherlands. The other two are from America, a female and a male that converted to Shia Islam, right? So these three have this in common. They all became Muslims. Two of them became Shia Muslims. And they have another thing in common. I've said it in the past, and I'm going to say it again. And this is where I need you guys to listen now. Not for my sake, even though I'm damaged and I need attention and love. And I need all the attention I can get. Forget me. May I decrease. May the Lord Jesus Christ increase. I want you to pay attention for the sake of the glory of Christ. Why it's important to know your faith and live it out in the power of the Holy Spirit. They have another thing in common. Okay. The other thing they have in common is that before they embraced Islam, they had already arrived at a point in their life where the Trinity could not be true. Jesus could not be God in the flesh, and Jesus dying on the cross for the guilty made no sense. And I've said this in the past, and I'm going to repeat it again. Okay, I've said this in the past, and I'm going to repeat it again. I have found among the testimonials of converts to Islam a common theme. If it's not because someone fell in love with a Muslim, a woman fell in love with a Muslim, or a man fell in love with a Muslim woman, the common theme you'll find among the so-called Christians that convert to Islam is that they had already arrived, come to a point where they could not accept the Trinity, they could not accept Jesus being the God-man, and they could not accept that Jesus, the God-man, died for their sins. They had already come to a point, they had arrived at an intellectual conclusion, at a point intellectually in their mind, that this could not be true, and therefore they were primed for something like Islam. Are you with me there? Are you listening? By the grace of Jesus Christ, as the Holy Spirit just fills us to understand for the glory of Jesus, because we're trusting the Holy Spirit to take over. Because without the Holy Spirit, I cannot do this. My trust is in Him to bless these sessions for the glory of Christ and transform us for the glory of Jesus. Okay. So that's what you're going to find. What you're going to find is they've already come to a point in their life in their quote-unquote spiritual journey or spirituality, the Trinity can't be true. makes no sense. Jesus being the God-man can't be true. makes no sense. Jesus dying for our sins, the God-man dying, makes no sense. So they were already primed for a religion like Islam. And what does God do? God will, in his grace and mercy, hand you over to the desires of your heart. If you put conditions on God, what he can and cannot be like, are you with me there? Think about it this way. Listen to what I'm saying carefully. If you put conditions on God and you tell God what he can and cannot be like, then God will hand you over to what you want. So if you tell God, look, you can't be a trinity. You can't become human. Jesus can't be the God-man. And the God-man can't die for the guilty. God says, okay. So you're already putting conditions on what I can and cannot be and what I can and cannot do. Instead of opening your heart and saying, God, whoever you are, I accept you as you are. If you are a trinity, I'll accept it. If Jesus is the God-man, I'll accept it. If it's not true, whatever is true, whoever you are, I will accept you as you are and love you for who you are and not try to make a God after my own liking and thinking and logic after my own likeness. If you come to God with an open heart, a sincere heart saying, whoever you are, whatever you are, I will accept you as you are, no strings attached, then the true God will show up. But if you start putting conditions on God and saying, this is what you can be and you can't be like this, then the true God won't show up. God will hand you over to the desires of your heart and will give you a God after your liking, after your thinking, after your likeness, after your image. Are you with me there? Let me give you the biblical basis for what I just said. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Though it's speaking to Israel, still this truth is the truth that applies to all the people of God in all generations of the end of the age. Here, Jeremiah 29, 13. Okay. And ye shall seek me and find me. Here is his promise. You will find me when you seek me, provided you seek me and search for me with all your heart. Did you catch it? 
Do you understand what, what God just said? Here's the condition. You will definitely find me, the true God, because I'm not far from any one of you. In fact, I'm the one who placed you exactly where you're at for the express purpose of knowing I am God and I exist and I love you and desire to save you. But the condition is it has to be from all your heart, all your heart, no strings attached, not telling me what I can and cannot be, what I can and cannot do. And if you do know the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, prompting you, moving you to see God with all your heart, with no conditions, and God will show up. But the moment you put a condition on God, the moment you tell God what he can and cannot be, be and what he can and cannot do, then God says, all right, then you don't want me for me. You don't want to love me and worship me for who I am and accept me as I am. You want a God after your own thoughts, after your own liking, after your own image. Well, there you go. Here's the religion for you. Did that, uh, you understand what I just said? Is that clear? Before I now give you the example to prove what I've been saying over the years. Over the years, I've been saying this like a broken record. That what you find in most of these converts to Islam, if they come out of a Christian background, is a common thread. They've already decided before they became Muslims, before they were introduced to Islam, God can't be a trinity. Makes no sense. Jesus can't be God in the flesh. Makes no sense. The God man dying on the cross for the guilty makes no sense. So they already rejected the very heart of the Christian faith and who God is. So they were primed for a false God, a God after their imperfect, foolish, fallen thinking, a God in their likeness. And they were primed for Islam or any other religion that teaches something similar to what they can and cannot fathom God to be, right? What they can and cannot accept of God. Is that clear? In Jesus' name, as the Holy Spirit protects me from Aaron stammering and enables me to speak truth and enables you to take in the truth for the glory of Jesus, the God-man, the eternal Son of the Father. Is that clear? Because now I want to play the clips to confirm this. And guys, from this moment on, I want you to challenge me and take, take me up on this challenge and test me. Listen to stories of so-called Christian converts to Islam and I want you to note how many times you will hear that so-called Christian saying, the Trinity made no sense. I couldn't accept the Trinity. I couldn't accept Jesus, a man, being God. And it made no sense that the innocent Jesus would die for the guilty. I want you to note how many times you're going to hear that from people who became Muslim before they encountered Islam. And so God, being gracious, says, all right, is that what you want? You don't want me? As I am, the triune God, who's the only God that exists. You don't want to accept Jesus as the God-man, though he is the God-man and the reason why you exist. He created you. And you don't want Jesus dying to save you. You don't want any of that? Okay. I have the right religion for you. Here you go. Okay. So are you ready now? In Jesus' name, let's play these clips. Two are males, one from the Netherlands. He used to work with... Gert Wilders, he became a Muslim. Another is from New York, he became Shia Muslim, and one is a female, she's from the U.S. as well. Let's hear. Okay, are you ready? This is Gert Wilders, okay? This is the man who used to work for Gert Wilders, who was an anti-Islamist, who's now a Muslim. In fact, ironically, right now as we speak, he's already given a talk in Berkeley, California, for the Zaytuna Institute, started by Hamza Yusuf, a renowned North American Muslim scholar, and his partner, Imam Zayed Shakir. He's actually in Berkeley now, today. I was hoping I would be able to attend it, but it was too far, so I decided not to. So he's now in the U.S., making the rounds, sharing his story of how he came to Islam from being an anti-Islamist who wanted to eradicate Islam from the Netherlands. Listen to what he says. Though he was raised in a... Orthodox Protestant home, a Reformed Protestant home. Notice what he says before he encountered Islam. I was um, I was uh, active in, uh, yeah, who are not so uh, happy that this, uh, the, the, the usual death threats and stuff like that. But uh, that this is as loud as it gets, folks. I'm sorry if you can't hear. Try to hear. Put up the volume. This is as loud as it gets on their end. Okay, listen. 
that's that's not something that that holds you back because uh, I, I yeah, it made me very happy and the 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 doubts I had is that what I told about Christianity the doubts I had when it comes to the Trinity of uh, God and uh, the crucifixion that the fact in Christianity people believe that uh, God had to sacrifice Jesus Christ so he could forgive the world but at the same time in the bible uh, it says that god is almighty and does what he want to do and i always thought as a child well if you are almighty as uh, god why can't you just forgive why is there a son who had to die before you can say okay i forgive so i, I thought it was illogical uh, still and i still think christianity is a nice religion only i i, I didn't believe the the the, the truth with a capital capital T, it, it wasn't there for me anymore. And uh, strangely enough, when I was writing the book, I got Islamic answers to Christian questions. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was the point for me that I thought, yeah, it, it gave me a lot of rest and uh, the, my heart and my head resonated. And that's something that I uh, didn't have before. So uh, when I felt that, and I of course, you believe it. Yeah, that that made me in the end um, uh, deciding to uh, to become a Muslim, and that's what I did. And, uh, did you hear it? I got Islamic answers to Christian questions. This guy was part of the party that wanted to remove Islam and Muslims from the Netherlands, and now he's a diehard spokesperson for Islam. He became a Muslim. But did you hear what he said, guys? Did you hear what he said before he embraced Islam? He already rejected the Trinity as irrational. Jesus dying for sins as irrational. It made no sense. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? This is before he even became Muslim. You want me there? Okay, that's the first testimonial. Second one, a Muslim, a female who became Shia a Muslim. Pay attention now. Because these three testimonies have one thing in common. They all came from Christian backgrounds and already come to a point where they could not accept the Trinity or Jesus as God in the flesh or Jesus dying for their sins. All three of them independently say the same thing. Okay, now watch. Here's the other one. Pay attention. Let's go to this one now. Break, 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 break. Ah, quiet, man. You and your commercials. Come on. Sorry. No, you are sorry. You're born sorry. Okay, kind of over the years as well, like I quickly developed depression and I was um, diagnosed with it when I was about 15 or 16. And um, it just got to a point where like I... W Sorry, just to correct myself, I thought she's from America, but she has an accent. So forgive me for that misinformation. Lord Jesus, save me from error. In Jesus' name, I don't like to be mistaken even on something so minor. I thought she's from America. I guess from her accent, she's not, or she may have settled in America, but forgive me for that. That's irrelevant, though. So, Lord, please save me from error in Jesus' name and save me from sin. Really just, I didn't really want anything to do with life. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to do my exams. I just, I didn't have the time for it anymore. I didn't see the point of it, you know. Um. Well, from a young age at my primary school, we were taught about Christianity, but I was at an age where I just, I kind of just believed everything that my teacher told me, but kind of as I grew up and I started doing my GCSEs, that was the first time I was really looking at Christianity, like with a more kind of mature uh, and more kind of critical academic kind of eye. And the biggest problem I had was the issue of the Trinity. Like it just did not make sense to me that God would almost kind of split himself up into three parts. And kind of from my point of view, like if God is supposed to be just and because and if he wants people to succeed and go to heaven, then the concept of God has to be easy to understand. Any human being, no matter what age or for what country they're from, what race, you know, whatever kind of education they have, they need to understand that concept because if they don't understand the concept of God, then surely they cannot succeed. And, you know, I just think 
if you go out and ask any person on the street, I think most people wouldn't be able to explain the Trinity and they wouldn't be able to understand it. Absolutely. Let alone if you had like just like a little eight year old kid and you were trying to explain it to it. So that was the biggest problem for me. And I think the issue about um, Jesus um, being the son of God, um, it just, he always struck me as a prophet. And from the parts of the Bible that I had read, I only started reading the Bible when I was about 18. But before that, the bits that I had read, there was nothing that was convincing me that he was more than a man. He was doing things that normal men did. He was praying, he was eating, he was drinking. You know, he just seemed like a normal man who was trying to portray a message. And I found it very difficult that to see God in such a weak and, you know, just a weak human being. It didn't make sense to me at all. Um, okay. Well, now, you guys, your comments show me you don't understand the severity and the seriousness of these testimonials. I'm looking at your comments, and what I see is mockery, insulting her. Uh, guys, you, you still don't get it. Here's what's sad about your comments. Instead of the, this convicting you to see the reality and the importance of knowing the biblical basis for your faith, you're mocking her, you're insulting her, a liar. Us. Folks. You either are living in a cave, you're living in La La Land, because if you're out there doing evangelism, this is epidemic among professing Christians. This is epidemic. People go to churches <clears throat> that are having the same questions, same challenges that the three articulated in their testimonial. In other words, this is common. This is th these three are just three examples of a widespread epidemic among professing Christians. So you can mock it. Yeah, she's stupid. She's lying. She, that means you guys really don't have the heart of evangelist. Okay, let me let me let me just say it, because I'm sharing their testimonies, not for you to mock them, to show you it is a common theme, a common problem. Because churches, pastors, are not doing their job of educating Christians why these doctrines are true and why they can trust the Bible. Because the Bible is historically accurate and the inspired word of God. They are not doing their job in answering these questions, helping these, these Christians to see the logic of the Trinity the two natures of Christ, and the biblical foundation for these doctrines. That's why I'm having you listen to them. But what you guys are doing? Ah, oh, she's stupid. She's lying. Oh, yeah. That's not the reaction I want from you guys. Because it's common. It's common. It's common among the masses of Christians that go to church. It's common. In fact, here is a challenge, another challenge for you guys. Here's another challenge for you guys. Okay. I want you to go to your church next Sunday. And I want you to interview people and say, do you believe in the Trinity? Can you tell me what the Trinity is? Is Jesus the Father? And when Jesus died, how can God die? And I want you to tell me what kind of answers and responses you receive. I didn't post these clips for you to mock these people, but to challenge you with passion from the Holy Spirit to want to know the biblical basis for these doctrines and have no doubt the Bible teaches these doctrines and be better equipped to then defend these doctrines, to articulate these doctrines, and show the biblical evidence for these doctrines, right? Leaving these people with no excuse for abandoning the faith. You understand what I'm trying to get you to do? If after you respond to their challenges and you respond to their questions and you give them a thorough biblical 
defense, a thorough, adequate, biblical presentation. Why God is a trinity. Why Jesus is the God-man. Why do we believe it? Because the Bible tells us God is a trinity and Jesus is the God-man. And that the only hope for our <clears throat> predicament is that the God-man die to reconcile us to an infinite holy God. And why you should trust what the Bible says about God being a triune God and Jesus being the God-man who needed to die for our sins and his love for us. And after you then refute their objections, demolish their arguments, and they still turn away, then you left them with no excuse before the judgment seat of Christ. You understand my point? Why I'm showing you these clips? Why you shouldn't take for granted these sessions? Not just my sessions. You should count it a blessing and an honor and fall flat on your face before the chime God and say, thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for these YouTube channels by David Wood, by John, what do you mean, All right? That are going in depth in the scriptures and showing us irrefutable proof that the Bible says that God is triune. Jesus is the God man. And why he had to die? And the historical and archaeological and textual evidence that they're providing, this overwhelming massive evidence that God and your goodness you have provided through your servants to show why we can trust the Bible as historically accurate, preserved, inspired, right? And that, that Jesus left the tomb empty as a fact of history, the resurrection, one of the best attested facts of history. So we have no doubt. We have the true faith and we have the true word of God and we worship the true God. And that true God became flesh, Jesus Christ, and he's alive, risen. So now we're ready to take captive every thought, every imagination, making every mind, every soul, every body obedient to the triune God, leaving them no excuse for rejecting who God is. You with me there? Before I go into the third clip, let me show you why I posted these testimonials. Do me a favor, Protestant believer, for the sake of uh, clarity. And again, it's not I'm going to shift away from the King James Bible, right? But I just want to read these verses in such a way that everyone gets the import of these passages. Verses inspired by the Holy Spirit through human authors where human authors are telling you what the Holy Spirit expects and demands of us. And we understand our responsibility before the triune God. We who know that the triune God lives and Jesus is the God man, he's alive forevermore and will return physically, bodily to the earth in the Bible's his word. Okay. Do me a favor, Protestant believer, if you don't mind, you can use the ESV. Go to 2 Corinthians 10. Anonymous, don't ask me that right now. I don't have time. That's my own conviction. And I'll get to that some other time. Anonymous, anonymous. And I don't know why you're anonymous. Tell me what your name is, brother, so I can know you by name. Because I know Jesus knows you by name, but I don't. But anyway, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6. ESV. Whatever you want to use. Even New King James Version, if you want to use that. I want you to send the legend to his fairy tale fantasy land that he's created in his mind this legendary land send him out of here okay second Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 6 read with me folks please re read read this is the language of warfare this is the language of military conquest this is the language of an army entering into enemy territory and decimating it demolishing it destroying it and taking everyone captive and enslaving them to their king, okay? L listen to the language. It's the language of warfare. It's the language of military battle, military conquest, where the conquering army, the conquering <clears throat> forces come in and demolish and decimate an area and taking everyone captive and enslaving them to the king. But it's spiritual warfare, not physical. Notice the language of Paul, folks. Let's read it. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Though we're in these flesh bodies, we don't war physically. We don't use physical weapons because our warfare is not physical, it's spiritual. So I don't take up a, a, a physical sword 
or a gun or tanks. That's Islam. That's Muhammad. Our warfare is spiritual. Now notice verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy. Notice the language, man. It's explicit. Strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Okay, let's look at verse 5 one more time. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 one more time. This is explicit in your face language, warfare language, military conquest language, but spiritual warfare, spiritual conquest, a spiritual army with spiritual weapons that are indestructible. Okay, watch here. We destroy arguments. Sadly, many Christians can't. And every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We destroy objections against the Trinity. We destroy false logic, masquerading as true logic that originates from fallen, imperfect, tainted, corrupted minds and or satanic influence. We destroy, demolish that, leaving them no excuse. For knowing that God is triune, Jesus is the God-man, he lives, and it's only his cross that can save you. And then we take your thought and make it obedient and slave it to Jesus. That's the language of warfare. Okay? So I didn't give you these clips. I didn't give you these clips. For you to say, ah, oh, look at her, she's a liar. Oh, she's just parroting what she hears. She's so stupid. That's not, that's not the reason why I gave you these clips. I'm giving you these clips to show you. These people had objections that their pastors and their fellow evangelists could not answer. And so they already came to a point in their life, the Trinity can't be true, Jesus can't be the God, man, the Bible can't be completely reliable. Okay? And so once they came to that conviction, and once they became convinced that the Trinity can't be true. Jesus can't be the God, man. The Bible can't be his word. And God cannot become a human being and die for the guilty. Then God gave them what they wanted. Okay. So now, no matter what evidence I give you, no matter what answer I give you to show you that you were wrong and misled and misinformed, and unfortunately, my church didn't do their job as I commanded them to because my pastors were ill-equipped. The shepherds that I raised to watch over the flock and protect the flock were ill-equipped. To their shame and humiliation? And now you're convinced the Trinity can't be true? All right, I'm going to give you over to what you want. Right? Are you with me there? Are you, are you getting it now? Are you with me here? Okay. Let me show you a qualification of a pastor. One of the qualifications of an elder, an overseer, and a bishop. Titus chapter 1, we're going to read verses 5 all the way to 14. I want you to pay attention to verse 9 and 13. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 14. Pay attention to verse 9 and 13. Please pay attention. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit is filling me and guiding me to tell you what the Holy Spirit needs you to hear and wants you to hear for the glory of Jesus. That's my trust that the Holy Spirit will take over and save me from even minor errors in Jesus' name. Okay, read. Qualification of a bishop, an overseer, a pastor. Notice what the qualifications are. This is why I left you in Crete. Right? This is why I left you in Crete. So that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband and one wife. See, these are the qualifications of an overseer, a bishop, an elder, what we call a pastor. If he does not meet these qualifications, he has no business being the bishop of the church of Jesus Christ on earth. Okay? He has to be above reproach, the husband of one wife. And his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. His children be better not be <clears throat> party animals. They better not be engaging in premarital sex and partying and getting drunk. If so, you better step down and take care of your household before you take care of the household of God. As long as they're living under your roof, you better make sure your children are not having premarital sex, 
right? Are not partying, getting drunk, and unruly. If so, you are disqualified from managing the household of God. Take care of your house before you take care of the household of God. It's right there. I didn't write this. I did not write this. The Holy Spirit told Paul to write these instructions. This is what the Holy Spirit expects of his bishops. For an overseer, verse 7, as God's steward. See, he doesn't own God's house. He is a manager of God's house. He's a manager appointed to make sure God's household is being managed according to God's rules. Not his rules, not the rules of the world, not the rules of the members, but the rules of God, the owner of the house. You run this house the way he wants you to, to run his house. Okay, pay attention here. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. That disqualifies me and David Wood. Or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled. Lord Jesus, give us the power to be self-controlled, self-constraint, self-restraint by the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Upright, holy, and disciplined. Now watch verse 9. Watch verse 9. Read or listen to it being read carefully. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. He must know the word of God as he was taught by qualified men and women who taught him the word correctly and interpreted accurately so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Wow. He must be able to teach the doctrines of Christ correctly, accurately, and rebuke those who seek to refute sound doctrine or oppose sound doctrine. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party, meaning Jews. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Now watch 13 and 14, folks. 13 and 14. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Now, let's re let's repeat chapter 1, verse 9 and 13 again. Post Titus 1, 9 and 13 again, back to back. Okay. Watch here. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine, also rebuke those who contradict it. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Okay. To be a qualified elder bishop, one of the necessary prerequisites, qualities that a bishop raised by the Holy Spirit to oversee the household of God, the church of Jesus Christ, one prerequisite, he has to know the faith, be assured of the faith, not only live it out to the best of his ability, but be able to then teach that faith, faith accurately and sharply rebuke those who oppose it. How many pastors do you think are qualified in light of what I just read? How many pastors are pastoring now meet this qualification? Meet this qualification. How many? So it's not God's fault. It's not the Father's fault. It's not the Son's fault. It's not the Holy Spirit's fault that there are people who profess to be Christian who are not getting satisfactory answers to sincere questions in the church because those pastors were not appointed by the Spirit. They were men who decided to be pastors not because the Spirit put it in their hearts and appointed them to that position, but they chose that position for themselves. You get it now? So I didn't share these testimonials for you to react the way you did. Ah, she's a liar. Ah, she, ah, it's stupid. Ah, or he's a liar. Ah, idiot. Ah. That wasn't the reaction I'm looking for. 
what the reaction I'm looking for is, what can I do as a lover of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, one who loves and worships the triune God because he's the only God that exists and knows the Bible is his word. What can I do to make sure that doesn't happen to someone else? What can I do to know my faith, understand the doctrines of faith and why these doctrines are true? Because they're anchored in the Bible. And how to know the Bible is the word of God. And then answer objections or rebuke those who oppose it for the glory. What can I do to rectify this problem and to erase this epidemic that's plaguing the church? You, you, you see my point? Praise God for your, your church. There are, there are churches out there, by the way, folks. Folks, don't think there aren't churches that are solid and there are men of God who are solid, pastors who are solid and qualified. They're there. They exist. You know how I know they exist? Let me give you two reasons how I know they exist. Two reasons. Number one, because the triune God exists. Jesus is alive. He cannot die anymore, and he's real. And because the triune God lives, God cannot lie but is faithful to make sure to raise up solid, able-bodied men who know sound doctrine and are teaching sound doctrine and are living it out by the power of the Holy Spirit and raising up spiritually healthy churches for the glory of Jesus. They're there because the triune God lives. That's the first reason. The second reason is I've met such men. I have met men and know of men that are sound in the faith, know sound doctrine, know the Bible, preach it soundly and correctly, and exhort members to know the book, live it out by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus, who know why they worship the triune God. I have met men and know of men. I know of them online through social media, and I've met people face to face. And I'm going to mention one by name. So someone asked me to mention one, and he actually follows my sessions. And this man is a humble servant of Jesus Christ because he's not too arrogant or puffed up so as to not seek knowledge and ask questions to receive further illumination into the scriptures. He's a man that over the years I have seen try to preach the Bible as accurately as possible and exhort his members to live the Bible to the best of their ability by the power of the Holy Spirit and desires to grow in his knowledge and understanding and is a, a devoted student of the Bible and wants to follow the Bible as best as he can, even though none of us can do it perfectly. And I know this man, and he's a man that's still in contact with me, and he was my pastor when I used to go to his church in Illinois. His name is Pastor Leland Johnson. Till this day, Pastor Leland Johnson, and I hope he's hearing this, because I want to give praise to God for him, for his love for the word, and his humbleness to want to learn the, the word with greater depth. This man tried to preach the Bible as accurately as possible and exhorted his members, himself included, to live up to the teaching of Scripture. And I pray Jesus Christ will bless him abundantly, him, his wife, and son, and preserve them to be a family sold out for Jesus, for him to be a man of integrity, to never turn to the right or the left, but maintain this course of learning the word, knowing the word, and seeking to live it out and preach it to the members of his church. In Jesus' name. So they're there, folks. They're there. They're there. They exist. They exist because the triune God exists. The triune God lives. Jesus is alive and he cannot lie and is faithful to build his church and raise up qualified men to know the word, to live it out, to love it, to proclaim it and die for it and to raise up healthy churches. They're there because Jesus is there. And secondly, I met them. You hear me there? Is that clear? Now, I'm going to go to the third testimonial. No, no, sort of truth. You didn't get it. It's not saying a pastor must be married. That's not what the qualifications are. No, sort of truth. If a pastor is married, he can only have one wife, meaning he cannot be a Mormon 
or a Muslim and he has multiple wives. But it's not a condition that you have to be married to be a pastor. If God has called you to celibacy and he's given you the gift to be celibate, you don't burn and you won't shame the name of Jesus and use your pulpit to entice young women, to seduce young women, to commit sexual immorality, then glory to Jesus, become a pastor. Paul is not saying you got to be. He's saying in case of an elder who's married, one wife. Because if that's the case, then Paul was disqualified from being a shepherd of the flock of Christ because Paul wasn't married. Right? Is that clear? Pray we hit that 200 mark soon for the glory of Jesus. Okay, if that's clear, I got to go to the third testimonial. The third testimony. Notice the common theme, theme among these three testimonies. And God forgive me, even a minor mistake such as this, where this young lady's from, eats me up. I hate being wrong. May God destroy my pride and help me to speak truth always in the power of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus and live that truth for the glory of Jesus. The third testimonial. This one, there's at least three clips we're going to hear from this particular gentleman. Now, for sure I know he's from New York. He said it. Queens, New York, right? Now, guys, please focus. Don't lose focus. Don't lose attention. Please listen. And the challenge isn't for you to say, ah, look at that stupid person. Look at that idiot. Look, you're trying to put God. Listen to what they're saying. Though they came to a point where they didn't accept the doctrines of the Christian faith, it didn't help that the people they asked questions from weren't able to answer them. Okay, pay attention now. Let's go to the third one. You ready? You ready? Hold on. The third one. We're just waiting for some, okay? Because I wanted to place these testimonials before I get into part two of, of Old Testament foreshadowings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, hold on. Never, I never went atheist or agnostic. I, I knew to have... It, it came in ebbs and flows. Like when I was a teenager, I thought Isa alayhi salam was an alien, you know, because he had no he had no father, you know. So uh, listen, I never I never went atheist or agnostic. I, I knew I knew always 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 that God was one, he, he, even in church, because the Old Testament Old Testament says the sins of the son cannot be atoned by the father, and the sins of the father cannot be atoned by the son. So that Old Testament verse negates the Christian idea of, of Jesus Islam dying for the sins of the world, you know? So, and e e even... In the Folks, pay attention. He's not just giving you his feelings or understanding. He quoted an Old Testament passage. He didn't tell you what passage he quoted. He was quoting Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 2 to 4. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 2 to 4, specifically verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 20 to 23, specifically verse 20. He was quoting Ezekiel 18. He didn't tell you it's Ezekiel, but that's where it's from. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to perfect my ability to recall these passages and then give me the power to live them out, live the, the truths of Scripture, live these passages perfectly in obedience to Jesus as a sign of my love for him. In Jesus' name, may we love you more and more and more, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the one true God. In Jesus' name. Now, pay attention now. He's not simply just telling you this is how I feel, but I saw in the Bible, man, I, and it makes sense to me. Pay attention. Why you need to know your faith, need to know your Bible, and live it out to show Jesus you love him. Okay? When you go to the Bible, Esau alayhi salam says, I have come to fulfill the law, not change. And while I'm here, not one period or tither will be taken away. So if he says that, how is he contradicting, you know, the law of Moses? So it, it just didn't make any sense, you know? And he, or when he's on the cross, he's like, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? So I asked my pastor, I was like, is he, is he talking to himself? Because if he's God and the son of God, like, it, it, it just, like, two and two is four. Two and two is not nine. It, it just didn't make any sense. And, and these stories in the Old Testament, like Prophet Lut, alayhi salam, he, he stuck for a while. He stuck with his daughters, you know, and David, Daoud, alayhi salam, he, he sent the general off to, to die so he could marry the... Like, these are, these are prophets of God. Uh, the, the one that really bugged me the most was uh, Prophet Noah, alayhi salam. He, after the flood, the, the ark settled, and he got, he got drunk and passed out nude. 
And then his son saw him and were making fun of him. This is a prophet. Like, if the prophet of God is getting drunk, why not the prophet? I don't drink. I, I, you know, I don't walk around naked. Like, why not? Why, 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 why didn't Joe Schmuel the prophet? Why, why, why did you give to know the Islam? Like, I just, it doesn't make, it didn't make any sense. And, you know, churches, and I later on learned that Sunnis, Wahhabis, Salafis, don't like when you question. Toe the line, says what it says, don't worry about it, don't think. Just bow your head, bow your head, take the, take the holy water. Like, and as, as uh, I got my bachelor's. Okay. Notice he said not just Christians, but he said uh, Wahhabis. You know why? Because he became a Shia Muslim. This man left Christianity, became Salafi, but then became a Shia Muslim. But now I want you to see what Riaz said. Our brother here, Riaz, he said something. Riaz Qureshi. He just said something. It's the same five to ten objections over and over again, almost verbatim. Exactly. Riaz, do you see the pattern? Different people all claiming to come from a Christian background. And their objections are the same because that tells you the satanic assault is the same. The satanic onslaught is the same. Do you see this commonality among them? It's not a script that they're reciting. It is proof of the demonic realm that Satan and evil spirits are operating with the same agenda to destroy people's faiths in the Bible as historically accurate, as inspired, to destroy people's faiths in the triune God and Jesus as the God-man who alone can save them by the blood of his cross. That's what you're seeing. You're seeing a common satanic assault. The reason why it's the same objection is not because these different people from different parts of the world who don't know each other are reading the same script. It's because the source of these objections is the same. Satan and his kingdom of darkness. Are you seeing the pattern? Who do you think it is that's whispering in their ears or putting their minds? The Trinity doesn't make sense. It's irrational. You believe this weak man who fell on his face and prayed and cried out to God for help? That's God in the flesh? You believe that weak man whom I tempted? Do you think I can tempt God if he's God? So see the source of these common objections. Satan. Satan. But now he's quoting the Bible. Now some people here are like mocking him and saying it's stupid and all that. But you know those same people, if I confront them with these objections, if I quote Ezekiel 18 to them, you know how many of them could answer that? Or if I say, Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That doesn't sound like God. God crying out to God? And if he's God, he's almighty. Why would he worry about anyone forsaking him? You see the point? Okay, now, let's finish. There's another, There's two more segments. Are you ready? And then we're going to get into it. What has Psalm 22 got to do with anything, Cloudy? See, it kills me when people quote Psalm 22 thinking that's an answer. An answer to what? An answer to what? Psalm 22, the one who's crying out these words is a servant of God. He's not God in the flesh. How's that answering the objection? Can you guys stop with, oh, he's quoting Psalm 22. Okay, and why is he quoting it? And what does it show? And how does that refute the objection? Come on, guys. Take it to the next level, the higher level. Okay, let's continue now. Any pastor, Sal? You sure about that? I asked two pastors about a month ago about the Trinity, and they sound like they were modalists. You're too confident. Here, now let's let's finish There's another segment. Here's another segment. Let's see. Six months. Down in the park or whatever, my church paid for it. So I, I felt in debt to them, not so much like I, I knew I knew I knew Trinity wasn't like I knew Trinity was false. I knew that was bogus. So I knew Trinity was false. I knew the way the prophets are just uh, portrayed in the Bible. I know that I know that was bogus, but I didn't know. Like the, the most that the most I learned about Islam was in high school, uh, seventh century Prophet Muhammad, and uh, they took over half the world. And that was like that's all I knew about Islam coming out of high school. But I always wanted. I always knew God was one without no partners. No partners. God is one. And I knew I I believed in the virgin birth of Isa alayhi Islam, but I didn't like. If he, if Isa al Islam is the best of creation, according to a Christian, why, why, why does God have to kill him to forgive me of my sins? 
That's why can't I just be like, yeah, Rob, you know, I'm sorry. Like, it, it, didn't, it didn't make any sense. And when I was like, how is Jesus God and the Son of God? Like, he's like, it, it didn't make any sense. So you're telling me God was in the womb for nine months, and then God was so helpless that he, he, he needed his mother to suckle on. And then 30 years later, he dies, goes to hell. Because in Christian theology, Isa al Islam was on the cross. And during the three days, he was in hell because he's, he's taking the punishment for all of us. And then he comes back and he's resurrected. Like, Just real quickly, uh, change the world. What do you want him to say? You want him to say Jesus when he's now a Muslim and he's going to call him by his Islamic name? You make no sense, brother. Come up with better arguments instead of mocking him. Just make why would why would God send him, send himself to hell? So so, and I would just I'd be like, yeah, Pastor, Pastor Carmen, if God if Jesus is God in the flesh, like why it just it just logic logic dictates, but it just it was one of and so God was dead for three days. Who's running the universe? I was like, who's running the universe? How am I breathing if if, if God's dead? You know, I might as well just start reading Nietzsche. God is dead, you know? It, oh, and you know, he, he came to earth to experience what it's like to be a human. But if he's God, he knows what it's like to be a human better than I do. He created me. Like, you know, he, he, it just, eventually they had enough and they were like, yo, you need to get out of here. Because I would just like, somebody, oh yeah, you're right, Henry. Oh yeah, yeah. And so too many people, I just, I didn't get booted out. I just, I was like 17 and I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing this. Okay, so I, final clip. You know, yeah. Uh, why do you accept the virgin birth? Because to him, God can do a miracle of creating a human from a virgin. But for God to become a man and die, that's where he had a problem with. And there are Christians who have problems with that. So, but anyway, I'm not justifying it, but you guys still need to answer these objections. Final one, we're done. Final one. This is the final one. I heard this entire section. It's too bad, man. I don't know why I don't run into these people. I don't see them. I wish they would come up and ask me these questions. I really do. But hey, anyway. Here's the final one. And two, like, you know, we just started talking about Islam. And I was like, so what about Jesus? Like, oh, we believe in the virgin birth. Die for our sins? No. Okay, okay. And so they handed me the Quran. And uh, for like the next three, four months, I had the Quran and the Bible. Now, Sai Christian, you know I can turn this against you, right? Because I want to ask you questions about the Bible you can't answer. So that means by your criterion, you're not a Christian. Sai Christian, sit down, keep driving, just listen. You make more sense when you don't say much. I love you. Not too much. Listen. Just cross-referencing, cross-referencing. And I was like, Islam, Tawheed, oneness of God. Jesus is a prophet of Islam. He didn't die for the sins of the world. Like, this is, this, is, this is what I believe already. Bam! That's what I wanted you to hear. What did I just say earlier? I said, God gave them the desires of their heart. Did you hear what he said? Islam, oneness of Allah, Tawheed. Jesus is a prophet. He did not first. And this is what I believed already. And no wonder God handed you over to Islam. Bam. Did you catch it? What did I just say earlier? And I've been saying it for years. It's on record. You'll hear me on my sessions. The sessions I've been doing for years. I said that the common thread theme you'll find among so-called Christian converts to Islam. They already came to a point, Jesus is just a man. He cannot die for the sins of anyone. And God is one, not just in essence, but in person. And because they came to that point, and this is who God could be, and God couldn't be otherwise, and Jesus can only be a man, God hands them over to Islam. He gives them the desires of their heart. Not because Islam is true, but because this is their judgment. This is part of the judgment of God that falls upon people who have already made up their mind and refuse to accept God as he is. I'll give you what you want, the desires of your heart. They take that as an answer to prayer, meaning, see, the true God answered me. No, this is the true God handing you over to the desires of your heart. Because now when you become a Muslim, the same objections you had against Christianity will now be leveled against you with greater force to show that your religion is irrational it's absurd, illogical, and Muhammad is a fraud, an immoral Satanist. But will you leave Muhammad then? No, you won't, because now God has exposed you for the liar that you are. So you had a problem with tr Trinity. Now let's talk about the problems of Tawheed. Let's talk about the problems of the Quran and its relationship to Allah. Let's talk about the statements in the Quran that shows that Allah is not a singular person because there are other divine beings that are united with Allah 
that can do what Allah does, such as the Spirit of Allah. Let's talk about those things. And you had a problem with the moral <clears throat> makeup of the prophets? Let's talk about your prophets. In fact, you're a Shia, aren't you? Can you now justify muta, which is nothing more than prostitution being passed off as marriage? So are you okay with your mother doing muta? A Shia coming and paying your mother for sexual favors? Saying, I'll marry you for three days, sleep with you like the whore that you are, and divorce you. So you're okay with that? See, that's where God now exposes them for the liars that they are. You with me there? This is where now God not only hands them over to the desires of heart, but now shames them and humiliates them. Because now all the so-called problems you had with Christianity can be multiplied against your deen and your prophet, proving he's a son of Satan. But now are you going to be consistent and abandon him? You get, you get my point? But what's what I wanted you, what did I want you to see from this? It's not that the answers are there, they're not seeking, Sai Christian. Not everyone is qualified to answer these questions. This is why when you see God sincerely, because Sai Christian is still not getting it. When you seek God sincerely and don't put conditions on him and say, God, help me. Show me who you are. I'll accept you for who you are. He will then bring you to the right sources and the right teachers and give you the answers. I am an example of that. Okay. Poor Sai Christian, he's not going to last here. You know, I'm going to block him too because he's not getting it. What do I do with even people who claim to be my friends and they're just stubborn? And they make mules look more open-minded. What do I do? Yeah. Okay, let's let's come back. Let's come back. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grows. Okay. Let me explain because you still don't getting it. It's like I think it's going over your head. You guys are not getting it. Okay, let's try this again. If you've come to a point where you're now determined God can only be this way and he can't be another, then God hands you over to the desires of your heart. But if you come to a fork in the road where there are objections you can't answer but are still humble and you say, listen, and you say, God, I don't know what the answers are to these objections. I'm even confused. I don't know what to believe anymore. But I beg you, please answer these objections. Show me who you are. And whoever you are, I will accept you as you are. And that's when God will bring you the right teachers and the right information. You know how I know? I'm one. That's my story. Okay. Let me tell you what I did not do. And this is the Holy Spirit, not me. He gets all the glory. May he crucify my flesh. Let me explain to you because you guys are so excited. Know-it-alls. That thinks, see, it wasn't. No, I'm trying to tie it in for you. Okay. When I got confronted by a Muslim apologist and he quoted verses from the Bible, verses from the Bible that seemed to deny the Trinity, seemed to deny that Jesus is God in the flesh, seemed to deny that Jesus could die for my sins. I didn't say, you know what? God can't be a Trinity. Jesus can't be God in the flesh. And there's no way he could die on the cross for the guilty. That's not just. That's that's a travesty of justice. What I did was, God, help me. I don't have answers to these questions. But if you answer these objections and show me what the Bible teaches, I will commit myself to then making sure that no other Christian gets rocked like I do. And here I am. A diehard Trinitarian who has no doubt the Trinity is real, that the Trinity is God, Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, my God, my Lord, my love, my life, my Savior, and the Bible is his word, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm willing to die for that. Do you know why? Because I didn't put conditions on God. The Holy Spirit worked in me and prevented me and did not allow me to put conditions on God. See, what happened with them, because it didn't make sense and it seemed to contradict the Bible, then it can't be true. It makes no sense. It can't be true. Instead of saying, I don't know how this works. And these passages seem to contradict what I was taught. But you know what? Maybe there are answers. Maybe they're not contradicting. 
the belief in God being a trinity or Jesus being God in the flesh. But you know what? I don't care what the truth is as long as I have the truth. God, are you a trinity? Then help me understand how these verses make sense in light of you being a trinity. Jesus, are you God in the flesh? See, they didn't. They came to a point. Sal John, see, when you start pontificating, and especially all caps, you're tempting me to, to block you, right, brother? Brother, no, you're wrong. You're so wrong, I'm, I'm embarrassed for you. No, it's not they didn't want to follow Jesus. It's too hard. Because Islam is harder to follow if you are an evangelical Christian. Because in Islam, you got to get up in the morning. You got to pray five times a day. You got No, no, don't say that because you're insulting my intelligence. And that is a stupid comment. Stop making statements that are not true. Sal John, how many times a day you pray? Do you get up before dawn to pray? Really? So do you pray five times a day? Let me call you out on this so I can teach you in love. Don't make stupid comments that will embarrass Christianity. Do you pray five times a day, Sal John? Do you pray five times a day? Okay. So, Sal John, don't ever insult me and my intelligence by saying they don't want to follow Jesus because it's hard to follow Jesus because the Islamic rules are even harder if you want to go that route. Listen more than you pontificate, you'll benefit. Okay. Just listen more than you pontificate. In fact, if you become a fanatical Muslim, you have to be willing to then travel and kill and be killed for Allah. Behead people, shoot people, and take the chance that you'll be killed and be beheaded. Don't ever insult my intelligence by saying it's easy to follow. No, it's not easy. In fact, one accusation against Christians by Muslims is, you got a very easy religion. You can pray when you want, fast if you want to, do what you want because Jesus paid it all. That statement do not ever make when you're dialoguing with Muslims, you're going to embarrass yourself. Don't ever make such a statement like that again. Okay? You'll do yourselves a favor if you listen more than you pontificate. Honestly, you will. Don't ever say to a Muslim, yeah, it's, it's hard to follow Jesus. He'll laugh in your face. Really, do you pray five times a day? Do you get up before the dawn and perform ritual ablution and then pray. And they do that throughout the rest of the day. And have you memorized the original languages of your book? Can you recite Exodus in Hebrew? Can you read in Hebrew? Can you read John in Greek? Not then shut your mouth. Okay. Don't tell me that. Now, if you belong to litur liturgical churches, like Orthodox or Catholic, you do pray certain times a day if you're faithful to your tradition. Because in the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church, they have set prayers every day. And they have a calendar where they've set up set apart days, even months, to fast. Right? So if you belong to those traditions, yeah, you're more disciplined if you're following them sincerely. If you're following them sincerely, you do pray at set times throughout the day. You do fast throughout the year, and not just a month long or 50 days. Of, there's actually certain days throughout the year where they commemorate the life of mighty men or women of God, and they're exhorted to fast on those days and come and offer special prayers. Am I wrong? But if you're an evangelical, don't you dare say to a Muslim, it's hard to follow Jesus. It's easier to follow Islam when they're going to throw these at you. Okay, anyway. Point is, what was the point here? I didn't think it was going to take this long for me to explain the point. What was the point of these testimonials? Confirmation of what I've been saying for over a decade. I've said the common thing among those who claim to be Christian that end up becoming Muslim they came to a point where they could no longer accept the Trinity or believe Jesus is the God-man or that someone innocent could die for the guilty, especially God becoming man to die. These things made, didn't make sense and or 
they assumed that the Bible contradicted these teachings. So they came up to them to a point where they already made up their mind. It can't be true. It's false. Because they came to that point where it could not be true because they thought logically it didn't make sense. And biblically, it's not taught in the scriptures. It's contradicted by the Bible. They were now primed for a religion that already agreed with their assumptions about what God can and cannot be, what Jesus can and cannot be, right? So they're ripe for Islam. You with me there? And this actually confirms the truth of the Bible. Do you know how it confirms the truth of the Bible? Do you know how it confirms the truth of the Bible? Because it says God will hand you over to the desires of your heart. When you refuse to acknowledge God and accept him as he is or be open and seek him with all your heart and saying, God, whoever you are, I'll accept you. Whatever your commands are, I'll accept. No strings attached. If you refuse to accept God as he is and accept his word for what it is and accept his commands as they've been revealed and you've made up your mind what God can and cannot be and what he can and cannot say and what he can and cannot do, then God hands you over to the desires of your heart. So he'll give you Islam or he'll give you fake, phony Christian preachers who will say, it's okay to be homosexual. It's all right. Jesus doesn't hate that. It's okay to be LGBTQ. That's all right. These commands don't apply to you. They're culturally conditioned. Jesus loves you as you are. And if you think you should be female instead of male, meaning God made a mistake in making you male, that's okay. Jesus is all for you. Yay, yay, rah, rah, Jesus is for you and your agenda and your will. He exists for you. You don't exist for him. God will give you those kind of preachers. God will give you those kind of pastors. God will give you those kind of churches. Because the Bible is 100% the word of God, preserved by God, and you cannot falsify it. You only confirm it. So the Bible says, the Bible says, if you refuse to worship the creator as he is, but instead worship the creation, worshiping your creaturely passions and desires, or worshiping a creature instead of the creator, then God hands you over to what you want. Okay. You don't want the Trinity? Okay. You don't want the God man? Fine. You don't want the God man to do for you what you cannot do for yourself, your only hope of salvation, dying on the cross to reconcile you to God? Sure. You don't want to follow my commands. You refuse to accept the fact that it's male and female, one born male, one born female, not someone who changes his gender, male and female that come together to have sex and between husband and wife, no boyfriends and girlfriends or multiple sexual partners. And you know who I'm talking to? You don't want that? Fine. I got just the right religion or the preacher and the teacher for you. You want name it and claim it? You don't want to suffer? Like my son suffered. You don't want to carry your cross and deny your soul. Like my son carried his cross and denied himself the pleasures of heaven. But you want it easy? I got the right teachers for you. Let me introduce you to Joel Osteen. Right? Let me introduce you to these compromised pastors who tell you it's okay to have sex before marriage. It's okay to be homosexual. It's okay if you're LGBT. It's, see, I got the right people for you. Here you go. Everyone with me there? So even these apostates and apostate churches and false teachers and these wolves in sheep's clothing pretending to be Christian, they're all proof of the Bible's accuracy. The Bible told us this would happen. So rejoice in the fact that all these false preachers and teachers and corrupt churches that have capitulated and are falling away and, and are in love with the world and want the world's approval, Confirm 100% what the Bible said would happen. They're all proofs that the Bible is absolutely the word of God, 100% true and cannot be falsified. So it's ironic that these apostates and false churches and these apostate Christians falling into all the, they're proving the absolute accuracy, truth, and reliability of the Bible. Hallelujah. Exactly sort of truth. Let me now repeat what he said. So then what is the answer? The answer is humble yourself and seek God without limiting him. 
absolutely perfectly said. I couldn't have said it any better. God bless you, sort of truth. Right? 100% on the money. Humble yourself before the living God, and God will reward you by revealing the true God and the true path, and then giving you the power of the Holy Spirit to live it out for his glory. Here, let me now give you the biblical basis for it. He was quoting Ezekiel chapter 18, Sargon David. Lord willing, in a future session, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll expound on it. Here, Ezekiel 18, not, not Ezekiel 18, sorry. Psalm 34, verse 18. Now, sort of truth, let me give you the biblical verses that confirm what you said aligns with the word of God. Psalm 34, verse 18. Psalm 34, verse 18. Exactly, Lisa. Guys, write that on a chalkboard in your Bible. What he said, humble yourself and see God without limiting him. Because Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The humble, the contrite, the meek, the marginalized, the oppressed. The Lord is near you. And if you're crushed and vexed in spirit, he comes to save you and flood you in his love. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Isaiah 57, verse 15. Uh, folks, I'm going to have to retitle this session and maybe do another session because it's already 90 minutes into the session. Isaiah 57, 15. Isaiah 57, 15. Watch here. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, separate and different and distinct from creation. I dwell in the high and holy place, but now notice this part, and with him also that it is of, that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Did you catch it? As exalted as I am, as majestic as I am, and separate from creation, infinitely greater than creation, I also delight to dwell with the one who's humble, broken, contrite, and meek. So not only do I dwell in a high place over creation, infinitely greater than creation, right, separate from creation, at the same time, I personally dwell with the humble, but the one who has humility, who is broken, who is crushed, who is marginalized, who is meek, who is not full of himself and doesn't put limits on me. I dwell with him as well. You with me there? James chapter 4, verse 6. James chapter 4, verse 6. God bless you. Read this, life is good. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, opposes the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Catch it? You are proud, you are arrogant, you think you know enough to tell God what he can and cannot be and what he can and cannot do, because that's pride. That's intellectual, spiritual arrogance to say, God, you can be this, but you can't be that. Oh, really? All right, then. Let me hand you over. That's pride, too. In your wicked, arrogant pride, thinking you know enough to tell God what he can and cannot do and what he can and cannot be, that is pride. That's arrogance. And God says, oh, really? You're going to tell me what I can and cannot be? What I can and cannot do? And you're going to tell me who Jesus can and cannot be and what he can and cannot do? Really? You're going to sit on the judgment seat over me, putting limits on me? All right. First Peter chapter 5, let's read verses 5 to 7. Key verses 5, but we're going to read 5 to 7. First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. Watch here. Likewise, 
Ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Be clothed with humility. Be humble. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Did you catch it? Did you guys catch it? Humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God, and in due time, be patient, trust in him, remain humble. He'll lift you up and exalt you to dwell with him. Because he resists the proud. He opposes the proud, but gives grace, mercy, compassion to the humble. And then he says, cast your worries on him. Whatever is worrying you, God, I trust in you. I know you're real. I know you love me and you're in love with me and I'm in love with you. I cast my burdens up upon you, my, my legal woes upon you, my children I cast upon you. All your care is cast upon him because he cares for you. What a beautiful word, amen? How beautiful, how amazing, how majestic, how supernatural the Bible is. The Bible is truly the perfect word of God preserved by the true God so we can hear his voice, know his voice, be comforted by his voice, be guided by his voice, and to fall in love with his voice. You see how amazing this book is? It has all the answers. Right? Isn't it amazing? And as Abdul Halid said, it's more powerful than we think we understand, way more, yes. We have not plumbed the depths and the beauty of the Bible. If only people knew the Bible and explored the depths, they would walk away with an awe knowing there is no way this book is human in origin. Though human authors wrote it, they did so by the Holy Spirit guiding them to give us the words of God in human language so we can understand. It truly is the revelation of the true God. And if this is God's word, that means the God of this Bible, he is real. He lives. He's alive. And he is in love with me. You understand what the message of the Bible is? In a nutshell. And I'm going to have to retitle this session. And God willing, I'm back. If you guys want me to come back, I'm back. But we got to get to 200 by this week in Jesus' name. I'll be teaching daily, God willing. You know what the, sto the story of the Bible is in a nutshell at the end? At the end of the day, you know what the story of the Bible is? Let me tell you what the Bible is. It's a love letter. It's a letter written by the lover to his beloved. It is the lover's letter to his beloved. And you are his beloved. I am his beloved. And he's the lover of our souls. And the letter is saying, this is what he's saying. I'm in love with you. I adore you. I absolutely love you. To the point, to the point, I would rather die on a cross so I don't lose you, than to live apart from you. Even though he doesn't need me, he doesn't need you. Jesus says, Jesus says, and I'm telling this, this is the story. I'm about to get moved in my heart too. <clears throat> I love you so much. I so love you that I left the glorious throne of heaven to do for you what you could not do for you, for yourself and pay a debt that you could not pay because I rather lose the glory of heaven for a season to have you than to lose you and live apart from you. And it's amazing. He doesn't need us. In other words, what Jesus did, let me, let me, let me, I hope it sinks in. I want it to sink in. Let it sink in. I pray, Holy Spirit, please help, help us to fathom the depth of this biblical truth, which is your truth revealed to us. I hope it sinks in. Jesus 
absolutely doesn't need you or me. He absolutely needs nothing in creation. He was God before creation. He is God now that creation exists. And he'll remain God forever and ever. And all he needs, he already has by nature, in unit with the Father and the Spirit. So what Jesus did is true, unconditional love. Meaning, it is altruism and absolute per perfection. What is altruism? Altruism is you do something unconditionally with no strings attached. You don't do something for, for selfish motive or to get something in return. If you actually examine the things you do and why you do it, there's always a string attached. You're always doing it for a reason. I'm working to take care of my family, right? I'm working to take care of my... There's always some conditional reason behind what you do, right? Jesus is the only one who could say... Guys, pay attention to this. Jesus is the only one who could say, I came to the earth and lived a human life and experienced human agony and human anguish and human misery. I allowed people to insult me to my human face, spit at my human face, beat my human face to a bloody pulp, whip me to the point of dying, to the point of death. And I allowed dirty, wicked, sinful hands to drive spikes in my hands and my feet. To hang on a cross. And I did all of that out of pure love for you, for your benefit, for your salvation, with nothing in return for me. In other words, whether you worship me or not, I'm still God. Whether you believe in me or not, I'm still God. Whether you love me or not, I am loved with an infinite love by my Father and the Spirit. I did it absolutely for you and your benefit, nothing for me. Because I don't need your love. I don't need your worship. I don't need your attention. I don't need your time. I don't need your prayers. I don't need your money. So I did it purely out of unconditional, unconditional Perfect, sacrificial, selfless love for you. No strings attached. No ulterior motives because I don't need you to exist. I don't need you to feel happy. I don't need you to feel joy. I don't need you for affirmation. Because before you existed, I basked and I continue to bask and will bask forever in the infinite love and joy of my Father and the Spirit. So then why did you do it? Out of pure, unconditioned love for you. Out of pure, unconditional love. That's all. That's why. So the Bible is Jesus' love letter. It's the Father's love letter. Is the Holy Spirit's love letter. It's the love letter of the triune God. A love letter for us saying, I love you, I'm in love with you, and I adore you. Folks, I'm gonna end it with this. I want I've said this before, I'm gonna repeat it again. The only thing we have contributed to the experience and reality of the triune God is misery, is pain, is heartache. And disappointment. Let, let me repeat what I mean. Before creation came into being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally exist as God and eternally exist in communion with one another, in love with one another, adoring the others. Perfect, infinite love, <clears throat> fellowship, and communion. You cannot add to their love. You cannot subtract from their love. So they needed nothing. They didn't. They needed no one to love them and affirm them because they loved and affirmed one another. Are you with me there? You understand what I just said? 
You understand what I just told you? Now let me prove that to you. John 17, 24. John 17, 24. So I want to end it with this way. We're going to have to retitle this. We're going to have to come up with a title. Okay. That was Augustine's distinction, Lopez. Now watch this, Marcy. I want you to read what Jesus says. Father, now remember, the disciples saw this flesh and blood Jew in the upper room praying this prayer. They saw and heard these words from this flesh and blood Jew. And as they're hearing him pray, he's looking up to heaven. And they hear this Jewish man named Jesus say these words. And they heard these words. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou loved me before the foundation of the world. Do you understand what he just said? Peter is there. John is there. James is there. Thomas is there, and they hear this man say, Father, I want them and all who will believe their message to be with me where I am, Father. Where I am, they will be to see my glory. Why do I want them to see my glory? So they can see how much you love and adore me. So they can see you're in love with me. You adore me. And you have been in love with me and you have adored me even before the world was created, Father. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? I have been the object of your love. You have been in love with me. You have adored me before the creation of the world. And Father, let them see how great your love is for me. I want them to see my father <clears throat> loves me. My father is in love with me. He adores me. And you know what? I love and adore him too. John 14, 31. John 14, 31. Amen, Abdul Halaj. Watch here. John 14, 31. Watch what he says here. <clears throat> this moves me in my spirit when I read this. Look what Jesus says. Look what he says to the disciples. But that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. I do. Arise, let us go hence. I want the world to know. I proclaim to the world, I love him. I'm in love with my Father. I love my, my, my father. I love Bobby. <clears throat> I'm in love with him. And he's in love with me. And I want the world to know I absolutely love and adore my Baba. I absolutely love and adore Abba. Abby. I'm in love with him. And he is in love with me. So... I just established from Scripture. I just showed you from Scripture. Before creation, the Father was in love with the Son. And the Son was flooded in the infinite love of the Father. The Father was in love with the Spirit. And the Spirit was basking in the infinite love of the Father and the Son. Because the Son is in love with the Spirit. And the Son and the Spirit are in love with the Father. And they're in love with each other. Each one basking in the infinite love of the other. Meaning they didn't le need my love. They didn't need your love. We couldn't add to that love. We couldn't improve upon that love. And we couldn't subtract from that love. You, you understand? You getting it? Is it sinking in? Is this sinking in? Is this sinking in? Let me show you how much Jesus is in love with the Spirit. You want me to show you how much Jesus is in love with the Spirit? You guys ready for that? Because I want to go out proclaiming the infinite love of the triune God and how much they love us. Let me show you what Jesus says when people blaspheme the Holy Spirit and accuse the Holy Spirit of being an evil spirit. Mark 3, 28 to 30. Watch here. Mark 3, 28 to 30. Let me show you how much Jesus loves the Spirit, how much 
He's in love with the spirit. Man, this story moves me, right? Because it's a true story. Mark 3, 28 to 30. Let me, I'm going to break it down what Jesus means here. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. And blasphemy is wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. Whatever sin you do, whatever blasphemy, you'll be forgiven. Watch here. But he that blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So why did he say this? Because he said the Holy Spirit in him is an unclean spirit. The Holy Spirit that was working in union with him, unclean evil spirit. And he says, let me tell you something. Any sin and blasphemy you say will be forgiven. But the moment you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you won't be forgiven. Now let me show you the love of Christ, how great it is. He says, I'll even let you insult me. I'll even let you blaspheme me and I'll still forgive you. But you insult the Spirit, you'll never be forgiven. Matthew 12, 31, 32. Matthew 12, 31, 32. Look how much love Jesus has for the Spirit, how zealous he is for the honor of the Spirit, how zealous he is for the glory of the Spirit. Look what he says, Matthew 12, 31, 32. Guys, read it. It's right there. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven men unto men. Now watch 32, guys. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, even speaking against me, the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. You insult me. You ridicule me. I'll forgive you. But notice what he says here. Speak the word against the Son of Man. It shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Do you see Jesus' love for the Spirit? You know what he just said? Here, I'll give you a human example. A very... Imperfect example. Hey, dude, you insult me, I'll forgive you. You insult my wife, I'll bust your face. Hey, you insult my dad, I'm going to bust your jaw. You can insult me and I don't care, but don't you dare insult my father. Don't you dare insult my mother. Don't you dare insult my kid. That's what Jesus is saying. See what he's saying? I will tolerate you insulting me, the son of man. But I will not dare tolerate you insult the Holy Spirit. Don't you dare insult the Holy Spirit whom I love and I'm in love with. You catch it? You got what he just said? Do you see how they love one another? Do you see how deeply, passionately they're in love with one another? <clears throat> the father's in love with the son and gives him everything. The son is in love with the father and obeys the father even to the point of dying. The Holy Spirit is in love with both. And Jesus so loves the Holy Spirit. He so loves the Holy Spirit. And not only that, this shows how much the father loves the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is saying all blasphemies will be forgiven. Meaning if you blaspheme against the Father, you'll be forgiven. If you blaspheme against the Son, you'll be forgiven. You insult the Father, you'll be forgiven. You insult me, the Son of Man, the Son of God, you'll be forgiven. Father and I will forgive you when you insult us, but you insult our spirit, we will never forgive you. Does it sink in, saints? Is it sinking in? Is it making sense? I don't want to move on. I want to make sure you got it. Do you see how much they love and adore one another? Right? Father says to the Son and Spirit, I'm in love with you. Son says to the Father and the Spirit, I'm in love with you, the two of you. And the Spirit is in love with the Father, and the Son says, I'm in love with you, Father. I'm in love with you, Son. And that's why Jesus says in John 16, 14, the Spirit will not glorify himself. He will glorify me, John 16, 14. You understand? You see what he's saying? The Spirit delights in glorifying the Son. He says, come, love him, worship him, fall in love with him. It's all about him. My duty is to bring you to fall in love with him, to glorify him, 
to bow before his feet. John 16, 14. He shall glorify me. There is no love greater or more perfect than the love of the Godhead. The way the Father is in love with the Son and the Spirit. The way the Son is in love with the Father and the Spirit. And the way the Spirit is in love with the Father and the Son. And guys, do you really want to get blown away? Are you bored or do you want me to really blow you away? Do you really want to see how much they love one another? You're, I mean, you guys up for it or are you tired? You want me to shut it down? You want to see... You really still, I mean, we'll never fully comprehend how much they love one another, but I just want you to get a taste. Let's go to, Col and by the way, let's do the ESV here or the New King James Version, a little more clear. Watch here. You want to see how much the Father absolutely adores the Son and the Spirit, and the Son absolutely adores the Father and the Spirit, and the Spirit absolutely adores the Father and the Son? Here it is. Colossians 1, 13 and 17. Watch here. It moves me in my spirit. If I think about this, I'll be bawling like a baby. So I'm not trying not to cry too much. Because I don't want people to think I'm a baby. Now watch here. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Guys, pay attention. The father has now translated us into the kingdom of his son whom he loves. His beloved son. The son of his love. Jesus is his beloved son. The son whom he loves. His beloved son, right? In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Here's where you're going to see how much the Father loves the Son. Watch, guys, pay attention. Verse 13 told, told you who the Son is. He is the Son of God's love, His very love, His very heart. My beloved Son, and I'm now taking you into the kingdom of my beloved Son so you can belong to Him. Now watch this. Watch this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Here, it let it sink in. I said to 17, Protestant, you're killing me because you keep posting more verses than I asked for, and I really want to come and find you and bust your face out of love. Colossians 1.16, pay attention, guys, in 17. Notice the love the Father has for the Son. For by Him, by the Son, the beloved Son, the firstborn Son of God, all things were created. In heaven, guys, pay attention. Don't let the devil distract you. And on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. That's what I want you to focus on. And he, Jesus, is before all things. He's eternal, timeless, uncreated. So he exists before all creation. And in him, all creation, all things hold together. Let's look at verse 16 one more time. Verse 16 one more time. Because you're going to see where I'm going with this. For by him, the firstborn of God, the beloved son of God, the son of God's love, his very heart that became flesh, by this son, the father created all things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. For him. Guys, you know what Paul just told you? Creation and everything in it was created as God's love gift to the Son. In other words, if you believe what you just read, the Father and the Son and the Spirit decided to create everything for the Son as an expression of the Father's and Spirit's love for the Son. In other words, the Father and the Spirit said, Jesus, we're going to show you how much we love you, how much in love we are with you. We're going to come together and create everything for you, the Son, the Lord Jesus. And the Father says, Son, this is how much I love you. Everything exists for you. The Holy Spirit says, this is how much I love you. I'm going to assist in creating everything for you, the Son of the Father. So this is the Father's way and the Spirit's way of saying, you see how much we are in love with you? All this exists for you. But now let me give you the other part of the story. You know what's the other part of the story? <clears throat> the son says, if this is your gift to me, 
to show me how much you love me, then I will do everything I can to redeem your gift for me and make sure I lose none of it. And that's where Colossians 1, 18 to 20 comes. Colossians 1, 18 to 20. Notice what it says here. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. What Paul is saying is, the one for whom all things were created is the very one who then reconciled it. In other words, what he was saying to the Father and the Spirit, how can I lose the very thing that expresses your love for me? How can I lose the very creation that you, Father, you, Spirit, created to show me how much you love me? If this is your gift signifying your love for me, how can I not do everything I can to then reconcile and save your love gift to me? <laughs> Do you see why it moves me in my spirit? Do you see why it moves me in my spirit? Are you seeing how much they love one another? The Father, the Spirit, along with the Son, create all this saying, this is how much we love you. The Father saying to the Son, this is how much I adore you. All of it is yours. It exists for you. The Spirit says, this is how much I love you. I come along to create all things in union with you to show you it's for you because I love you. I'm in love with you. And what is the response of the Son? <clears throat> What's the response of the Son? If this is your gift to me to show me how much you love me, how can I lose your very gift that expresses your heart and your infinite love for me? I will do everything in my power to preserve your love gift to me, and I will not lose it. See, when the Holy Spirit gives you eyes to see and ears to hear, there is no way you can read this book and not believe it's the Word of God. Absolutely no way if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. And there is no way that you cannot Help but fall in love with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. <clears throat> so Jesus comes and saves me because he says to me, do you know you are the proof of my, my Father's love for me? And you know how much I love you and I'm in love with you? I can never dare lose you the very expression of my father's love for me, the very expression of the spirit's love for me. How can I lose you? Right? So what's the point of all this? Before creation, to wrap it up, before creation, the father, the son, and the spirit were in love with one another, in perfect communion with one another basking in the infinite love of the other so they lacked nothing and needed no one and do you actually think honestly do you actually think you can improve on their love the love they express to one another add to it do you think you can subtract from it do you think they really need your love to complete them and to affirm them do you actually think that right do you think you can? Can I add to your love? Absolutely not. I, 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 I cannot love to the depth of the way God loves. Impossible. Can I take away your love for what? Absolutely not. So then why did you do it? Why did you come and die for me when I cannot improve on the love you've already experienced and enjoy and continue to enjoy? And you don't need my love, and you don't need anything from me. In fact, everything I have is from you. The breath I breathe is from you. The health I have is from you. My ability to earn money and to buy food is from you. Everything I have is from you. Nothing I have 
can benefit you, can add to you or subtract. Why? And the answer is, because I love you. I'm in love with you. And you are, you are the sign, the expression of how much the Father and the Spirit love me. How can I not be in love with you? How can I not do everything in my power to redeem you? When you are the sign and the proof, the mountains are the sign and the proof, the trees, the vegetation, the plants, the animals, all this created as a sign and proof of how deep the Father and the Spirit love me and are in love with me. How then can I not be in love with you and how can I lose you? So the only thing you've added to God is pain, misery, heartache. And because of our existence, Jesus chose. He didn't have to, but because he's in love with us and love with the Father and the Spirit who gave us as an expression of their love for the Son, become flesh, become human. Experience human limitation. Experience being beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, nailed to a cross, spikes in his hands and his feet. All of that he experienced because of our existence. If we didn't exist, Jesus would never become human. If we didn't exist, Jesus would have never entered a world that didn't exist. And Jesus would have never been beaten by the hands of sinners, his own creatures. and He would never have to experience any of that. And yet, because we exist, the only thing we've added to the Godhead is pain, misery, <clears throat> sadness, heartache, disappointment. Things they never experienced before our existence. Did you know that, guys? Before our existence, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit never experienced disappointment because they never disappointed one another. They never experienced heartache because they never broke the heart of the other. They never experienced misery because they never made one another sad. Never, never experienced all of that. The moment we existed, Father, Son, Holy Spirit began to experience heartache, pain, misery, sadness, and disappointment. And then the son experienced human death and misery, all because of our existence. So the only thing you can take credit for saying, God, I take credit for the fact that because of my existence and this fallen world, you got to experience, and the son got to experience, and the spirit got to experience pain, misery, heartache, and disappointment. And on top of that, the son got to experience what human misery and pain and frailty is all about because he became flesh in order to identify with me and save me from my misery. Something that wasn't true before our existence. Now, did God know all this would happen when he created? Yes. So he knew when he created this, he would experience all this? Yes. And he still went ahead and created it anyway? Yes. Why? Out of pure love. Why did you do it? You knew beforehand that when you created this creation, we would disappoint you. We would hurt you. We'd break your heart. We'd make you miserable. We'd disappoint you. And then the sun would come down and become human and experience human limitations and human misery, human death. And you still did it. Yeah. And yet you don't need any of this. You don't need any of this. Absolutely not. I don't need any. Why did you do it? You know what his answer is? His answer is, because I love you. I did it out of love. So that others besides ourselves could experience this love that defies all knowledge and is beyond description. That's the only reason? The only reason. Out of pure love for you. So let me end it with how much the Father loves us because of Jesus. John 17, 23. Let me end it with how much the Father loves us because of Jesus. I've shown you how much the Son loves us. And I've shown you how much they love one another. But let me show you how much the Father loves you and me if we believe in Jesus. And we're going to end it with this. 
Jesus praying again. Now remember, put yourself in the upper room and you're hearing Jesus pray these, pray th th these words before you. You're there and you're hearing it and you're seeing it. You're Peter, you're James, you're John, you're there. Thomas, you're listening. Pay attention. You're hearing him pray these words aloud. What does he say? I and them, I am all believers, and all believers, Father, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me. Now watch this last part. And love them even as you love me. Did you catch what Jesus said? And they're hearing it. Imagine you're sitting there or you're standing there. And Jesus is looking to heaven and he's praying to the Father and he says, Father, I want the world to know that these believers and all who believe through their message, all who believe their message, that I'm in fellowship with all of them, united to all of them, in love with all of them. And I want the world to know you love them just as you love me. I don't think it's sunk in. You understand what Jesus just said? You understand what he just said? My father absolutely loves you just as much as he loves me. Do you know why? Because I'm in you and you belong to me. Oh, so And so when I indwell you and I clothe you with my love and clothe you with my righteousness and cover you by my blood, my father sees me dwelling in your heart and where i dwell my father cannot help but be in love with you and love you just as much as he loves me my father loves you who belong to me just as much as he loves me my father is in love with you just as much as he's in love with me if you belong to me and i'm in you this is the story of the bible the story of the Bible is the lover's love letter to the beloved. And we in Jesus Christ who love Jesus, are in love with Jesus and belong to Jesus. This is our love letter. And the lover says, open it up. Read my words so you can know the depth of my love for you. And the father says, and the son says, and the spirit says to us in Christ. We are in love with you. We absolutely love and adore you forever and ever. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Can you put in the New King James or ESV? Romans 8, 35, 39. Obviously, the Holy Spirit had me talk about something different today. So we're going to have to change the title. Maybe Ed will come up with a title for it. I don't know because I don't know what the title is. Romans 8, 35, 39. Guys, read, please. Holy Spirit, please open their hearts and minds to take in these words from you. Okay, read this, guys. <clears throat> now, this is the one time I wanted you to post Romans 8, 35, 239, and you skip. Oh, boy, are we upside down. Romans 8, 35, 239. Amen, Abdul Hadij. Jesus conquered the wicked and Satan by love. Because love is an all-powerful force that God uses to conquer his enemies and to destroy wickedness. Okay, guys, read, please. Please read. Read. And may the Holy Spirit etch these words in your souls, in your hearts, in your minds, in all of us, and in my children, please. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. People hate us. They want to enslave us. They want to torture us. They want to kill us. They want to rape our women, enslave our children, imprison us because we love you and the Bible and we won't compromise. That's what it's saying. That's what Paul is saying here. Now notice 37 and 39. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, persuaded, that neither death, even the threat of death, even the threat of death, people threatening to kill us and murder us, right? even that, or anything in this life, whether the threat of a corrupt judge and lawyers trying to destroy me, not even that, nor angels, 
nor rulers, nor things present, nor the things to come, what the future may bring upon us, nor powers, whether heavenly or earthly, no matter how high or deep, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Right? That is God's promise to you. If you belong to me, are in union with me, and I am in union with you, my love is all-powerful. The Father's love, the Son's love, the Holy Spirit's love is all-powerful. And it's all-powerful to conquer and destroy everything that comes against us to try to separate us from that love, which is impossible. So we thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Flood us in your love. Flood my daughters in your love, even their mother in your love. Conquer their mother by your love. And by your love, remove Martin from their lives. And by your love, bring them to me. And by your love, save me from these trials of this judge. And by your love, provide for us to do this work for your glory. And do it with integrity. And live for you and die for you. By the power of your infinite love, O oh Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we trust in you and in your love and help us to be in love with you. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And he is Yehovah to the glory of God the Father. And may he be praised and loved forever and ever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Amen. Lord willing, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Because it's our head tomorrow between 6 and 7 Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time, Canadian time, God willing. 6 and 7, between 6 and 7 Eastern Standard Time, Canadian time, New York time. Pray for me. Pray for the provisions. Pray the Lord will keep bringing those provisions to do ministry, to serve him faithfully, to worship him, to love him, to study his word, teach his word. Pray in Jesus' name. He brings my daughters to me because March 12th, this Thursday, my oldest, my firstborn turns 10, and I'm going to do a live session where I wish her a happy birthday and tell her and her sister how much I love them, and I want you to join in to wish her a happy birthday. This Thursday, God willing, and I'm going to send it to them so they can have something archived on my channel that though I cannot love them the way the Father loves them and Jesus loves them, the Holy Spirit loves them, when I see them, I see Jesus and his love for me, and I will do all I can to love them as much as I can and try to be Jesus to them. So they will know their earthly Baba loves them and is in love with them, but they have a heavenly Baba who has a heavenly son and a heavenly spirit who loves and adores them more than they can imagine. And please pray for them that Jesus keeps them healthy and provides overabundantly for them and comfort them that I'm not there physically. And bring them to me this year, sooner than later. And pre please, please, please pray. Lord Jesus, this man, Martin, must be gone. No man in their lives except me. And bring their mother to repentance. Because they have to be raised by me. Because I belong to you. And they belong to you. And you brought them to me so I can raise them in your love, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. And pray that God will continue to protect me from all harm. And from corrupt. Judges and lawyers in Jesus' name. See you tomorrow, guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed.